everyone, welcome to New Hope. We are so glad you connected with us online. Before we get started, don't forget to subscribe below and click that notification bell. Did you know you can take us with you wherever you go? Search for New Hope Sunday Sermon Podcast in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. So uh, you got a little taste of Harvest of Hope there. Thank you to Jackie Alexander for putting that together, I think, this morning. So she did a good job. And um, what a joy it was. What a joy it was to be part of um, providing about 320 families with meals, but there was prayer and there was, um, we passed out Bibles and gospel bracelets and there was laughter and love and just, I am thankful to be part of a church that is so supportive of a ministry like this. I think I put out last week, remember I asked for turkeys and the very next day, we had 106 turkeys come in. On Monday alone, we had 106 turkeys come in. You guys are amazing. So when I think about what I am thankful for this year, please know that New Hope Church and my brothers and sisters at New Hope are, um, I'm just so grateful for you. So, and God is so good. How we have seen God work through this church over the past year. What a joy it's been. Um, so thank you all. Thank you all for being so supportive of Harvest of Hope and so many of the things that we do. Um, so let's, let's just pray. God, we do thank you. We thank you for yesterday, for um, just the blessings of giving. Thank you for Harvest of Hope. We thank you for Hope for Her, who we partnered with, and they work with so many women in crisis in our community, and we're grateful for them. We're grateful for all the people who volunteered. We're grateful for all the food that was donated. We're grateful that we were able to share the gospel with so many people and pray with people. Lord, sometimes we're just in awe of how you work, and we give you all the glory and praise. God, I lift up this message, and I, I just pray that, that you guide my words. I'm feeling a little tired, and I need it to be you, God. It can't be me. On my own, I mess it up. So guide my words, Lord. Thank you. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So today is the last Sunday in our thankful series. I hope you've enjoyed um, the thankful series. So we talked, if you recall, the first week we talked about Queen Esther, right? And being thankful for purpose and the opportunity to be used by God. The next week, Pastor Roberto preached on Ruth and Naomi, one of my favorite stories, and how <clears throat> we're thankful for community and communion with the people of God. And last week we talked about being thankful um, for God's protection, and we looked at the life of Daniel, how we are thankful that sometimes God offers physical protection, but always God offers spiritual protection. So today we're talking about Jonah and being thankful for second chances. And sometimes when I'm doing my sermon prep, I totally go off on rabbit trails, and I wouldn't believe that. You know, that's the beauty of Google, right? You can really go off, you can like kill a couple hours. <laughs> Gone. So I thought I would share this with you, because I thought it was fascinating. This, what is Jonah best known for? The whale, that's right, the whale slash big fish slash sea monster, depending on who you, who you read. But um, what's interesting about Jonah is he's been depicted in so many different art forms around the world. And I got off on this tangent of looking at all the European masters, they all painted Jonah. There's just, even, even Asian art depicts Jonah, which is fascinating to me because they're not, um, it's not a Judeo-Christian culture. So, but, so I thought I'd just share a couple of these with you. Here's one. This is Peter Lassman, um, who's a Dutch master. This was the early 1600s. So that is one ugly fish, isn't it? It is just really, so he's trying to get out of the fish in that one. Let's look at the next one. So this is a Orthodox icon of Jonah. And this one I thought was particularly amusing because he's half in this fish and he's half out and he's reading a scroll like it's nothing. I go, every day I'm stuck in a fish. And then the next one, oh, who knows? 
How many of you have seen Veggie Tales Jonah movie? Yes. Yeah, so right, that's right before he is swallowed by the whale. Gosh, I thought about us all like singing the theme of that, but then I know it would we would sing it for the rest of the week. It never, those things never get out of your head. Um, so there is. So we have all these depictions of Jonah and the big fish, right? But there's so much more to Jonah than the big fish. Who was Jonah the man? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Jonah the man. So he was a Jewish prophet during the time of the divided kingdom. He actually lived in the northern kingdom of Israel. He, his book is the fifth of the minor prophets in the back of the Old Testament. So if you have your Bible and you flip open to the Old Testament, it's kind of in the back. There are 12 minor prophets. And that's Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. To be a minor prophet, you had to have a difficult name, apparently. (laughs) But why? So there are 12 minor prophets. Jonah was the fifth one. They're not minor as in less important. They're minor because their books tend to be smaller. In fact, the book of Jonah only has four chapters. And it's a really fascinating book. And it's an easy read. So if you've never read Jonah from front to back, do so this afternoon. I mean, it will take you all of 15 minutes, maybe. But it's an interesting book. And as you read it, you can't help but smile because there's humor in the book of Jonah. There's times when you will laugh out loud. I don't know if you've ever laughed out loud as you're reading scripture, but, but you will in this book. It's really interesting. And it's so much more about a, than, than simply about a big fish. So we're going to walk through it today. We're going to talk about the different aspects of the life of Jonah and what we can learn from it, how we can apply it. So the first chapter of Jonah opens up with God telling the prophet Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh and preach against the Ninevites because of their wickedness. So what do we know about Nineveh? This was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians were ruthless people. So they worshiped many gods, but they're really most best known for their brutality. I mean, these were vicious, vicious people. Um, Scholars guess that the story took place around 760 BC, mid 700 BCs. Um, when Assyria was relatively weak. Now, we know that the kingdom of Assyria doesn't stay weak because just one generation later, they conquer the northern kingdom of Israel, right? Now, possibly because he was fearful of the Assyrians, we don't quite know, but Jonah immediately disobeys God, immediately. Rather than heading over to Nineveh, he goes to Joppa, which is a city on the Mediterranean coast, where he boards a ship in the opposite direction of Nineveh to the city of Tarshish. It's about as far in the opposite direction as you could possibly get. And so I have a map to show you this. So you can see where Joppa is. That's um, the Israeli coast, Mediterranean coast. Nineveh would have been 550 miles to the northeast of Joppa in what's now um, modern-day Iraq, whereas Tarshish was 2,500 miles to the west of Joppa in what is now southern Spain, which basically would have been the other side of the world at that time. He was trying to get away from God. In fact, Scripture says that Jonah was running away from the Lord. And just so you know, running away from the Lord never ends well. I don't know, maybe you've tried it, I've tried it, but God runs much faster than us and he will catch up with us, amen? Jonah chapter one, verses four through five. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea And such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up, and all the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. And where is Jonah when all this is happening? Well, he's he's under the deck. He's asleep. And the the, um, captain of the ship peeks his head down, and he's like, what are you doing? 
get up. We're all going to die. Wake up and start praying to your gods. So this is what's so interesting. All the Remember, he's on a Gentile boat. And all the sailors, they're desperate and they're praying to their gods. And here we have a Jewish prophet, a Jewish man of God. And he's not praying at all. He's fast asleep. So the sailors are pretty desperate, and they cast lots to see which one of them brought on this calamity. They're sure that someone must have done something really bad for for the weather to turn so quickly. It was smooth sailing, and now it seems as if the world's going to end. So the lot lands on Jonah, and they look at him, and they say, who are you, and what in the world did you do? And Jonah's answer is interesting. Starting in verse 9, he says, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now, he identifies himself as a man of faith, but he's not acting like one. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. He says that so calmly. I know it's my fault. But these guys, these sailors, they were pretty nice people. And they didn't want to just chuck Jonah overboard. So they continue to paddle and they paddle and they paddle. And eventually they realize we are all going to die. So they throw Jonah overboard. And they, what's interesting is they ask for forgiveness from the one true God whom they now know and believe in. So Jonah's in the water, and God provides this very large fish. It must have been a massive fish to swallow Jonah. And scripture says that he stayed in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. And so chapter two begins with Jonah sitting in the belly of the fish. I can't imagine that was very comfortable or smelled very good for that matter. And so it's amazing. Something about sitting in this nasty fish gut makes him see the error of his ways. And he prays to God and he's remorseful and he's filled with lament. And he says, oh God, I've been disobedient. Remember me for I remember you. My prayer is rising up to you. And he gives this very beautiful, eloquent prayer while sitting inside a fish. And God hears his prayer. Chapter 2, verse 10, it says, And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Usually vomit isn't good, but in this case, it was a good thing. He got out of the fish. And just like that, Jonah's life is saved. And God gives Jonah a second chance to do what he has called him to do. How And I love this. How beautiful is this? Jonah deliberately disobeyed God. Deliberately disobeyed God. God, But yet God sought him out. God chased him down, saved him, and gave him a second chance to do what he was called to do. And for me, I read this, and this has echoes of prevenient grace, doesn't it? How we will run away from God, and yet God seeks us out. God woos us toward him. You know, I think about God leaving the 99 in search of the one. And then when he catches us, we have this second chance to say yes to him and to live our life, live out our calling um, of following Jesus Christ. That's what God does for us. But there's more to the Jonah story. Oftentimes we stop there, right? But there's so much more to the story. Chapter 3, God again tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against the people for their wickedness. So Jonah chapter 3, verses 3 through 10. And you can follow along on the screen. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. 
A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And remember, throughout scrap, scripture, people put on sackcloth and ash when they're, when they're grieving, when they're sorrowful, when they're remorseful. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is a proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered in sackcloth. Isn't it funny the people and the animals get to wear the sackcloth? Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented, and he did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Such an amazing thing. If you look at the bulk of the Old Testament, prophets are usually not treated very well. Think about it. They're they're persecuted. Um, They're maligned. At times, they're even killed. None of that happens to Jonah. He's in this lawless, evil city, and he basically walks through Nineveh. And he gives what could be considered the shortest and the worst sermon ever, right? All he says is, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. He's walking through the city, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And what happens? Rather than harming Jonah, they believe him. They repent. They put on sackcloth and ashes, even the king. In fact, the king orders that all people and animals will be covered in sackcloth. They will end their evil ways and they will cry out to God in repentance. And so there's humor here. Picture like the goats and the sheep and sackcloth and they're buying in remorse and sorrow to God. But God sees how their hearts have changed. God sees how they've changed their behavior and, and they're seeking to do better and he forgives them. He forgives them. God doesn't bring on the destruction that he threatened. And what comes next is probably, to me, the most interesting part of the book of Jonah. Jonah the prophet, who is probably the most successful prophet in all of the Old Testament, he gives this very short, not that well thought out, message, right, as he's walking through the city, and revival happens. Everybody repents. It's like a Billy Graham crusade. Everyone turns from their evil ways and professes faith in the one true God. And yet Jonah is unhappy. He doesn't want God to show compassion to the people of Nineveh. Jonah wanted them destroyed. Chapter 4, verse 2 reads like this, he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. He is so melodramatic. (laughs) Take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. So we get this picture of why Jonah really fled. Why was he headed to Tarshish? Because he knew that God was compassionate. He knew that God would give the people that Jonah hated a second chance. And it made him so angry. Jonah was angry. Jonah was super melodramatic. And he's basically pouting. He's pouting. Jonah was more than happy for God to save him, but he sure didn't want God to save the Ninevites. And God shows this incredible patience right here in the scripture. Jonah, throwing a fit, goes and he finds a place to sit just east of the city. It's like you can kind of picture him. He pulls out his lawn chair. He's sitting there. He has a good view of Nineveh because he's hoping that well, God may throw fireballs down on the city after all, and he wants a good view. So he's sitting there, and it's hot, and it's sunny, and God provides a plant to grow and provide shade for Jonah. 
And this makes Jonah happy and a bit self-righteous. So God then provides a worm to eat the plant. And Jonah sits there with the sun just beating down on him. And he's feeling so sorry for himself. Have you ever been there? He's feeling so sorry for himself. And he says, get this, he says this. It would be better for me to die than to live. And he's acting like a spoiled brat. Chapter 4, verse 9. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. (laughs) But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And then the whole book of Jonah closes with this question that God asked Jonah. And should I not have concern for the city of Nineveh? in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. I love how he includes that. And also many animals. This whole time, Jonah has thrown this big fit because while he is happy to receive God's grace and mercy for himself, to receive a second chance, he was glad the plant came and, and he was angry when it withered. Because he believed he deserved God's grace and mercy, right? He's a Jewish prophet. And he was so angry when Nineveh was not destroyed because he felt those people, they did not deserve God's grace and mercy. They're wicked. Jonah's attitude was similar to that Pharisee in Luke chapter 18. Maybe you've read about him. He said, God, I thank you that I'm not like those other men. Jonah's thinking, God, I thank you that I'm not like those Ninevites. So he sat in that shelter outside the city, just waiting for all those people, men, women, children, animals, to be destroyed. And God asks him, should I not be concerned for Nineveh too? All those people, all those animals, they also get a second chance. You, Jonah, with your Jewish pedigree, are not better than those people. You know, most of us, we look at Jonah and we read through this and we think, man, what a jerk, right? But then I started praying about it and I'm like, am I any better? Are we any better? I mean, I I guarantee that there are people that we consciously or unconsciously think don't really deserve God's grace and compassion. I mean, we do, right? Because we're good church-going people. We deserve second chances. We deserve God's grace and mercy, but I'm not so sure about those people. And, you know, for each of us, that, the, that those people might be different. I mean, we live in a really divisive society. So what I've often discovered is that if I'm on this side of the political spectrum, it's those people, the ones that are on the opposite side that don't deserve God's grace and mercy, right? Or if we want to make it a little more personal, think of the person in this world that you dislike the most. Maybe you despise this person. Maybe it's someone who hurt you or hurt someone you love. So think about it, and think about how God's mercy and love extends to that person, too. So hard, isn't it? From the most vile to the most violent, God loves them and wants a relationship with them. Now, of course, they have to be willing to accept God's grace and his offer of forgiveness, but if they do, forgiveness is theirs for the taking. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he died for all. All. And as I was thinking this, I was, I was writing this down, this other thought came to me about how people who love and have said yes to Jesus come in all different shapes and sizes, right? Are at all different places and stations in life. Are in different cultures, races, ages, political persuasions. So we have to be so careful 
to not pigeonhole those people we think are Christians and not, right? It's not for us to judge. It's really between them and God. Now, Jesus gives us a beautiful picture of second chances. His ministry was marked by fresh starts and second chances for for many people who, who the rest of the world viewed as outcasts. He redeemed and elevated people that others convicted and condemned. There was Matthew, the tax collector. Remember, people hated tax collector. Well, Jesus made him one of his disciples. There was a demon-possessed man in the graveyard. Remember, he cut himself with, with rocks and he howled all night long, and yet Jesus healed him. He became a, quite the evangelist, too. There's the bleeding woman. She was unclean. She had, was bleeding for 12 years. She was probably filthy, ostracized from the Jewish community, and yet Jesus said, daughter, your faith has made you well. There was the Samaritan woman at the well who had had all those husbands, right? There was the one, um, Zacchaeus, the wee little man, who was condemned as a sinner for overtaxing the people in his community. And he meets Jesus, he's repentant, and Jesus says, today, Zacchaeus, salvation has come into your house. And then there's Peter, Jesus' very best friend, who denies him three times. And yet Jesus grants him forgiveness, gives him a second chance, and he becomes the leader of the early Christian church in Jerusalem. Because Jesus so freely extends second chances, because he gave us this incredible example of offering forgiveness freely and loving extravagantly, he's also called us to be people of second chances. You know, um, I was thinking this was, we didn't plan this out, but as I was working on this message about how appropriate it was that we're talking about Jonah and second chances the week of Thanksgiving. Why? Because many of us will gather, right, with friends and family. We sit around the table with people who maybe we're different from, and there, there are arguments, and families are an interesting mix, aren't they? So we may gather this week with some difficult family members, or friends, or in-laws who think differently from us. There may have been hurt feelings or bad arguments in the past. Maybe they don't agree with your political opinions. Maybe they have a different idea about faith. Maybe they've been patronizing. Whatever it is, something, some conflict. Now we have this perfect opportunity to live out what God has demonstrated to us. The people of Nineveh were pretty bad. They were wicked, but God loved them, and he desired their repentance. Jonah was selfish and self-righteous, but God loved him and desired his repentance. We see God's grace and mercy most clearly through the work of Jesus, who loved and healed and fed and cared for all kinds of people, even us. And his love was unconditional. He's forgiven us. He's given us new life, abundant life, really. He's given every single one of us in this room a second chance through his work on the cross. And now we have this opportunity, really a call, to extend that same love and forgiveness to others. And I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I think, I think there's probably nothing harder than trying to love people as God loves them. It is so hard. Maybe we think, well, they don't really deserve it. Well, neither did we. Neither did I. I am so thankful for second chances because God gave me one, and that has made all the difference. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are thankful for second chances. And we, I pray right now, Lord, that as we think about Thanksgiving week, maybe there's someone in our life who we need to extend grace and love toward. Maybe we don't like them, but we know you love them. So I pray, Lord, that you give us the courage 
and the compassion and the motivation and desire this week to demonstrate your love in new and extraordinary ways. Thank you for second chances, God. Help us be people of second chances. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thanks again for joining us. Did you know? Find out more, visit findnewhope.com.